Hi, I'm Gil Welch. In this short take, I'm going to take on overdiagnosis bias. One of the reasons why survival always rises following early detection. Let's make sure we're clear about the word survival. It's the period of time between diagnosis and death. It's literally called the survival time and it's measured in months or years. Now, of course, it's aggregated across multiple patients to provide survival statistics. One of the common ones is median survival. It addresses the question, how long does the typical patient live? Literally, the middle survival time. And then there's five-year survival and ten-year survival. Their proportions. They each have a numerator and denominator. The numerator for five-year survival is the number of cancer patients alive five years after diagnosis. The denominator is cancer patients. So this statistic can be interpreted as what proportion of patients are alive five years following diagnosis. Ten-year survival is very similar except the numerator is now cancer patients alive ten years after diagnosis. So it can be interpreted as what proportion of patients are alive 10 years following diagnosis. In this video, I'm going to encourage you to think about this question. What does a higher median 5-year or 10-year survival mean? Now, we assume it means that patients with bad cancers are living longer, but there's another possibility and I want you to think about it. It may just mean that more people are being told they have cancer. Why is survival biased by early detection? Well, there are two reasons. One is lead time bias. The second is overdiagnosis bias. Lead time bias is de dealt with in another short take. In this short take, we're focused on overdiagnosis bias. Before we can talk about overdiagnosis bias, we need to talk about overdiagnosis. Overdiagnosis is best understood in cancer, so we'll focus on cancer overdiagnosis. What is it? It's the detection of an asymptomatic cancer that either A will never progress, or in fact will regress, or B will progress slowly enough that the patient dies of other causes before symptoms appear. So the important concept here is this is a patient with a cancer that is never destined to bother them. Note, because screening tests attempt to find preclinical disease, some degree of overdiagnosis is probably the rule, not the exception in cancer screening. Now to think about cancer overdiagnosis, it's important to understand the heterogeneity of cancer progression. And I want to share that with you with a simple picture. On the y-axis, I'm going to put size, the size of the cancer. And at the bottom is when cancer starts. And we'll say it starts with an abnormal cell. Of course, it starts with some genetic aberration, but for our purposes, the cellular level is good enough. And it gets big enough that it actually leads to symptoms. There's a certain size at which the cancer will start to cause symptoms. And then it gets large enough when the cancer will actually cause death. Now we need another dimension. And that dimension is time. And time is bounded. That's the red line. It's bounded by the point that people die from other causes. Now that we have this background, let's consider various types of cancer. That's a fast-growing cancer. It starts as an abnormal cell, very quickly goes on to cause symptoms, and quickly goes on to cause death. That's a bad cancer. Unfortunately, it's a cancer that's often missed by screening tests because it's growing so fast, there's very little opportunity to catch it early. This is a slowly growing cancer. It is definitely growing. It definitely goes on to cause symptoms, and it definitely goes on to cause death. These are the categories of cancers where screening arguably will have its greatest effect. 
This is a very slowly growing cancer. It is in fact growing, but it's growing so slowly that it never causes symptoms before the patient dies of other causes. This became very clinically evident to us in prostate cancer in older men. Now here's something you might find hard to understand, but here's a cancer or something that meets the cellula cellular definition of cancer, but in fact is non-progressive. It's not growing or even more unusual things that meet the cellular definition of cancer but regress. We now know that happens too. Now, what is cancer overdiagnosis? It's detecting any one of these three arrows, something that the patient would otherwise never experience. These have been dubbed pseudo disease, literally false disease. I kind of like that label because I think of disease as something the patient experiences and pseudo meaning false is something that the patient's actually not destined to experience. Now if you want to see the evidence for cancer overdiagnosis I suggest you read the article Overdiagnosis in Cancer with my colleague William Black. It's in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute in 2010. Or Read the book, Overdiagnosed, with my colleagues Lisa Schwartz and Steve Veloshens. It's all about the problem. But let me give it to you in a nutshell, the general problem. In the past, doctors cared for a population, but they waited for symptoms to develop, and then they diagnosed and treated those patients. They waited for the cancer symptoms to develop. The early diagnosis ideal was to take that same population and advance in time our ability to diagnose those patients destined to develop cancer. With the hope being that the, those we found early, that the natural history was that that was the group destined to develop symptoms. But the reality was quite different. Whenever we look for cancer early, we find more patients now the natural history is more complex. Hopefully we got those who are destined to develop symptoms. But there's now definitely another fraction, those not destined to develop symptoms. That's the overdiagnosed fraction. How does that all relate to survival? Well, that overdiagnosed fraction, those patients tend to survive a long time. How overdiagnosis bias increases survival, even if there's been no change in the number of deaths. Imagine before screening that a thousand patients were diagnosed with progressive prostate cancer. Five years later, 400 are alive. What's the five year survival? Well, it's 400 over 1,000 or 40%. Now imagine after screening, of course those same thousand patients with progressive prostate cancer are diagnosed, but now a new fraction is diagnosed, a thousand patients with prostate cancer pseudo disease. Five years later the picture looks like this. Again there are 600 deaths. But what's the five year survival? Well how many people are alive? At the end of five years, 1,400. Out of how many? 2,000. The new five-year survival is 70%. But you can see there's increased five-year survival, but there's no real improvement. On either side of the screen, 600 patients have died. All that's happened is the Patients with pseudo disease have inflated both the numerator and the denominator of the survival statistic. Remember that. In overdiagnosis bias, pseudo disease inflates both the numerator and the denominator of the survival statistic. That a thousand patients get added to 400 to become 1400, and the thousand patients in the denominator have another thousand patients added to go to 2000, and the new five-year survival is 70 percent. 
All right, there's time for a CME quiz for all the clinicians in the audience. Try this. What's the fastest way to improve cancer survival rates? Pick one. A, high-dose radiation followed by autologous bone marrow transplantation. B, high-dose NIH funding. C, have every man, woman, and child donate $50 to the American Cancer Society. Or D, give every man, woman, and child a cancer diagnosis. You know, sometimes the absurd makes the point. Of course that would increase survival rates, wouldn't it? Remember, an overdiagnosis bias, pseudo disease inflates both the numerator and the denominator of the survival statistic. Let's add 100 million patients with pseudo disease to the numerator and 100 million to the denominator. All of a sudden, survival's virtually 100%. Survival always rises with early detection. Survival will rise if cancer mortality falls. Survival will rise if cancer mortality is unchanged. And survival will rise even if cancer mortality rises. In fact, survival is rising for all cancers in the United States, even those whose death rates are rising. So survival always exaggerates the benefit of cancer screening. Survival is always misleading in assessing the value of early detection. The most common setting is to compare patients who are diagnosed late with those who are diagnosed early. Follow them forward in time. Measure median survival or five or ten year survival. Survival is misleading. Of course the early patients are going to survive a longer period of time. Epidemiologists would say survival is biased. That's what biased means. A second setting, comparing patients who are diagnosed clinically because they have symptoms with those diagnosed with advanced imaging, things like CAT scans, MRIs, diagnosed before they have symptoms. And making that comparison and measuring survival, survival will be biased. Or comparing patients who are diagnosed in the past, 1980 for example, with those diagnosed more recently, 2000, where there's just a lot more tests available, a lot more CTs, a lot more MRIs, a lot more earlier diagnosis. You compare survival of those two groups, of course it's biased. And finally, international comparisons, comparing patients diagnosed in Europe with those diagnosed in the United States where there's so much more advanced diagnostic technology going on, so much more detection before symptoms. Comparing median or five or ten year survival, that's a biased comparison. Why is survival biased by early detection? The first is the lead time bias. The second is the overdiagnosis bias, what we focused on here. And to think about this problem, think about what does a higher median five year or ten year survival mean. We assume it means patients with bad cancers are living longer, but it may just mean that more people are being told they have cancer. Well, that's it. I'm done. You're done.